and welcome to the chapter 11 lecture video for ecology. Today I am wearing one of my appropriately themed outfits. This is one of my many bee dresses in my Miss Frizzle arsenal. Um, there's lots of little bees on it. And I also have in a bee scrunchie from Daniel Chorba who is also a student at St. Vincent. You can buy scrunchies from her at Scrunchiella on Instagram. They're very good scrunchies. We're not going to talk too much about bees today, but we are going to talk about them very briefly. So let's do it. Let's talk about intraspecific population regulation. Pew pew! We just had a lecture on population growth and ways that you can model and predict population growth. And now we're going to talk about how population growth is regulated um, and changed by internal and external factors to a population. During the last lecture, we talked about exponential growth models. We talked about, oh, was it the last one or was the one before that? I can't remember. <laughs> Oh, the weeks are blurring together. Right before this, we talked about exponential growth curve models. We talked about geometric growth curve models. Uh, you can use them to predict changes in populations. Now let's talk about um, slightly more realistic models because in neither, in neither of those models is there any limit on the size that a population can grow in an environment. And we all know that that's not true, that every population of a species has a limit at which it can grow in a realistic environmental scenario. And we call that limit something which should hopefully be reviewed from GenBio2, K, which is the carrying capacity. So K uh, is the maximum sustainable population size for the prevailing environment. K, the carrying capacity. That's what K stands for. And K is a function of the supply of resources in the environment. So once a population size reaches its carrying capacity, or K, then it stops growing. And in a few examples we'll talk about later, maybe even declines. And a change in population size, which is N, is through time is predicted by the logistic model of population growth. Initially, the population grows exponentially at low values of n, but as n increases, as it increases here, the rate of growth decreases. So what you're seeing here is that this, what's happening once it reaches k over two, K over two is called the inflection point. Once it re reaches K over two, that's when the growth rate of the population is at its highest, is here. But once it hits this inflection point, the rate starts to decrease, and then once it hits its carrying capacity, the rate of growth is zero. So, that's carrying capacity. Now, the density of a population can regulate uh, how it grows in size. And um, there can be different types of density-dependent factors that work to regulate population growth, one of which is density-dependent mortality, which is death, and then the other is density-dependent fecundity. So this is mortality rates that are dependent on how many individuals are within a population within a given area, and then this is birth that is regulated by the density of individuals within a given area. Um, population density can influence stuff other than resource availability, but there are also density independent factors that can work to regulate a population size. Um, so this is a graph here from this paper that I pulled. And since I know 
Um, I know at least Taylor's interested in Lyme disease, and my student who's not in ecology this semester, Rachel Keller, is screening ticks on campus for Lyme disease. A lot of people have gotten Lyme disease at St. Vincent. I thought I'd include this figure looking at Lyme disease ecology and where some of the missing gaps of knowledge are that would help us control uh, its prevalence in tick populations. And in this figure, they had some areas which they think might be density dependent within their life cycle. So um, from this paper, they suggest that possibly the feeding success of the larvae might de be dependent on how dense uh, the population is in the environment and same with the feeding success of the nymphs and their feeding success and their ability to find hosts that um, amplify Lyme disease that then allow them to carry it in through the tick population, their ability to find hosts might depend on how dense um, their host populations are and the, ho the population of the ticks themselves. So that's just an example of density dependence. Now you can also have competition occur um, within populations, particularly at uh, high population densities where lots of individuals in a population of the same species have to come in contact with each other. And I think comp intraspecific competition and interspecific competition, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, I think competition is a really, really interesting thing to study. Um, so let's talk about some four, four different types of competition, and then I'll talk about this really cool paper that I found on social spiders. Um, oh, that's a bee that they're eating, isn't it? I didn't even notice that until right now. Anyway, <laughs> scramble competition is when growth and reproduction are depressed equally across all individuals in a population um, as the intensity of competition increases. So this is not one individual winning out over another. It's there being a, such a high density of individuals within a population that they're all equally not getting access to something. Usually we're talking about food resources here that if the population density is so high that there's not enough food to go around, what's happening in scramble competition is that everyone is getting the same limited amount of food. Now, on the other hand, contest competition is when some individuals in the population claim enough resources while denying others in the population a share. So this would be like, um, well, let so this is not really an example right here, but let's say this spider and this spider are duking it out and this one takes this bee away from that spider. That would be contest competition. So some individuals are getting plenty of resources and others are not getting enough. There's an unequal distribution of resources in contest competition. Now exploitation, um, exploitation and interference are, are different um, terms for looking at scramble versus contest competition. Exploitation is when organisms don't compete through direct contact with one another. So this is like um, something gets to a resource first and eats it and then is gone by the time something else shows up. So this, this is indirect competition. And then interference is when individuals directly interact with one another to prevent each other from accessing resources. So Exploitation and interference are both types of contest competition. Exploitation is indirect contact where something gets to something first and eats it before something else has a chance. And then interference is when they actually like fight each other and expend energy to protect a resource from another individual of the same species in a population. Now this was a really cool paper I found where they were looking at whether or not scramble or contest competition was at play in these populations of social spiders. They live in colonial nests with each other. So all of these spiders are living in a colony with each other and they can have varying densities. They can have really, really large colonies or really, really small colonies. And so what the researchers did is they experimentally manipulated the size of the prey uh, that they fed to artificial colonies of the social spider and then they looked at whether prey size could alter the degree of scramble versus context competition. 
and then potentially influence the population dynamics of that colony. So what they found was that large prey were shared more evenly than small prey, and that individuals in, within a colony that might be in poor condition were more likely to feed when prey were large than when they were small. So the size of the prey directly influenced whether or not there was competition happening inside of a colony. The size of the prey captured by the social spider colonies increased with colony size. So they also looked at uh, wild colonies and the size of the prey they were able to capture in addition to experimentally manipulating the size of the prey. And they found that scrambled po competition may be more common in large colonies because there's more individuals to feed. And so if you put a large um, prey item in there, you're probably going to see in a large colony, you're probably going to see scramble competition and they evenly split it up amongst the spiders in the colony. Um, scramble competition combined with the fact that the prey biomass per capita was declining as colonies grew beyond a certain size, then explained why extremely large colonies of the soci social spider suddenly go extinct. So what they also saw is that sometimes you would find like these huge colonies in the wild and then they would just kind of disappear and it might just be because an extremely limited um, lack of resources being able to be shared amongst everyone because of scramble competition. So I just thought that was really cool. And social spiders are really weird. <laughs> Now let's talk about density dependent growth. This is when the growth of single individuals within a population is dictated by how many individuals are in that population. Um, so when a population size starts to reach carrying capacity, you're gonna have increased competition between individuals. Each individual, like we just saw with the social spider example, is gonna get less than optimal nutrition. If they're, everyone's getting less food than they really need for optimal growth, then they're going to grow slower um, than they normally would, and they might reach a smaller adult size. This is a really great, simple experiment in clover that demonstrates this phenomenon. So you can see that when they planted smaller numbers of clover plants per pot, they had much higher mean weights per plant that grew in that pot to adult size. But when they planted lots of clover per pot, the mean weight per individual plant in that pot at the end of their growth and development was much smaller. Um, really simple, elegant experiment to look at density-dependent growth in populations. So this actually would be an example of scramble competition between the individual clover flowers in the pot. So everyone is for the most part, receiving an even number of non-optimal nutrients. Now let's talk about the effects of population density on mortality. Um, there's a phenomenon called self-thinning that can occur in some populations. Mostly it's been observed in fish that live in streams that called self-thinning. So this is when you have a Progressive decline in density once a population reaches a large size and or carrying capacity, and then an increase in biomass of the individuals that actually remain in that population. So this was a study that was done of brown trout in two streams at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab, also called Snarl. Uh, you might remember, because I talk about it all the time, that I did... Uh, bumblebee research in Sierra Nevada. Snarl is a research station in the Sierra Nevada, but it's on the eastern side. So we talked about how in the Sierra Nevada on the western versus the eastern side, there's a rain shadow on the eastern side because it's not near, it's less close to the ocean, uh, and it's kind of blocked from the precipitation that the western side gets from being more close to the ocean. Uh, so it's a little drier over there, but they do have streams and things like that over there, and that's where Snarl is, is on the other side. Not that you really need to know, but... <laughs> so they did these um, population studies in streams near Snarl, um, looking at um, population densities in 
uh, a few different sites in two different streams and uh, different populations. And what you can see is that in 1987, um, the average biomass was pretty small, but the density was really high. And then that high density um, induced mortality in the population because there was competition for resources, which then resulted in the following year in a less dense population that had larger biomass, that had larger sizes, and then even the year following, this still high density induced further mortality that then resulted in higher biomass of the individuals that were still surviving in that population. Now let's talk about another study looking at density dependent mortality um, in a different type of fish. These are steel, a steelhead trout study that was done in these artificial stream channels at the University of British Columbia. Um, so what they did is they manipulated the density of competitors and food abundance to look at density dependent growth and mortality in these fake stream channels they built for steelhead trout. So they had, they manipulated food availability. So they had a lot of food, a medium amount of food and low food. So this is the where lim resources are the most limited. This is where resources are the least limited. And then they also um, artificially induced different densities. So they had lots of fish and only a little fish. And you can see that at low density, there doesn't seem to be as huge of an effect of food availability on um, the population size of the fish. So if you don't have very many fish to begin with, um, it does look like that if they're resource limited, you might see a decrease, you might see mortality induced because they're food limited, but it's not very dramatic shift in the population size. So this is just the proportion of remaining fish after a few weeks. Obviously with the most food, you don't see much change at all. Um, and the number of fish that are still alive eight weeks later. But as you look at like the synergistic effects of density and food resource availability, it has a really big resource availability, has a synergistic effect on the population with high density. If there's low food, but a lot of fish to feed, that can induce severe mortality within the population is what you see here. And you see it, um, the same thing happening here just to a lesser degree than at the high density. Now this graph over here is the same experiment and it's looking at the body length of the individuals that are still remaining each week. Um, and at low density, the fish are getting bigger for the most part across all of this. But if you compare it to the high density, um, the fish are growing at a slower rate, obviously. So even with optimal food, at a high density, they're growing at a slower rate than if they would be growing at a low density because they're still not, they're still having to, they're still resource limited, right? So they're not getting optimal nutrition. Um, and you see a little bit of the same effect with the medium density too. So really interesting study looking at the interaction between population density and food resource availability. Now, is there self-thinning happening here where they're killing off the individuals and then increasing body mass. I'm not really sure you could say that. Obviously, there's thinning happening in the population, like we talked about. But if we're thinking about a strict definition of self-thinning, where then the biomass of the individuals increases afterwards, you're seeing biomass increase in all of these. So I wouldn't necessarily say this is like as good of an example as the previous example that I just showed you. So really cool study that they did. Now let's talk about um, how competition between individuals in a population can reduce reproduction of individuals. So this is a study that was done of harp seals. Look at that chonk, feeding her mini chonk. Um, in harp seals, the mean age of sexual maturity increases with increasing population density. So because sexual maturity 
in harp seals is strongly correlated with weight gain. So they have to like basically reach a minimum weight size before they are sexually mature and reproductive. If nutrition is limited in that environment that delays when they reach sexual maturity. And so if you limit resources by increasing the number of mouths that have to be fed, then you're going to delay reproduction, which is basically what you see going on here. So, um, at low population densities, you've got an age of about five years old um, for reproduction. At really high population densities, it goes up by a year and a half um, because it takes longer for them to reach uh, that weight threshold for sexual maturity. Um, fertility in these individuals is also density dependent. Um, so as seal populations increase, the percentage of females giving birth also decreases because like we talked about in the previous lectures, giving birth is energetically costly and a pregnant female harp seal is going to require more nutrition than a non-pregnant female harp seal. Uh, and so if nutrition is limited, that's going to decrease the number of harp seals that can give birth. Um, there's a pretty strong correlation that you can see here where um, fertility decreases with population density. And living in these high densities can be very stressful in general to the individuals living in them, not just based on nutrition and food resource availability, but for other reasons as well. Um, and sometimes there are ways that individuals in a high density situation um, will respond to that high density um, through phenotypic plasticity to maybe try to uh, alter that high density or control that population density. So one example is in mice. Um, there are pheromones in the urine of adult rodents that can actually ex encourage or inhibit reproduction. So at really high densities, rodents can produce a pheromone in their urine that will suppress the reproduction of other individuals in the population, which I think is really, really interesting and cool. Um, bees actually do this too. So um, this is actually, I put this in here because this is a bee you're probably not very familiar with. Um, and maybe if we can figure out a way to do it safely, we can do a honey tasting of all of the honeys I have in my honey collection because I have some honey from these bees. These are stingless bees. This is the queen right here. Um, these are the workers. They don't sting. Um, but in most bees, they've, researchers have found that the queens are producing pheromones that are suppressing the reproductive capabilities of the workers in the colony. And so you can, even though this is a form of sociology, which is a special instance of a population because you can sometimes think of them as a single organism. Um, there are methods of um, population control in place because the queen generally produces pheromones that inhibit the fertility and reproduction of the workers in the colony um, so that they are not also reproducing, which I think is cool because bees are cool. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention in the, in the rodent study where they were looking at the reproduction inhibiting hormones in high densities, um, researchers exposed the urine of female mice from like a really dense population to mice in a lab and it delayed their puberty. But if they collected urine from mice from a low density environment, it didn't delay the puberty of the developing mice, which is like so weird and so cool. Social behavior, well, like we just talked about here, in bees can also limit populations. Um, contest competition within social organisms can establish rank and dominance. Uh, we're going to talk about a wolf pack example specifically here. So rank and dominance within a wolf pack is going to determine which individuals mate and reproduce and which ones get the most food. Um, and the size of the pack is going to influence the food availability to each individual within the pack. So what happens 
when there is a high density of wolves in a wolf pack. If there's high density, um, mortality is going to increase and birth rates are going to decline because when pack density is high, there's decreased food availability and individuals may even be expelled from the pack if they can't find enough food to go around to everyone. So they, the alpha male and the alpha female uh, are the ones that are asserting dominance over that colony. They're the ones who get it first, and if there's too many mouths to feed, they might expel individuals out of their pack. Now, what might happen in moderate or low densities? In moderate, dens moderate densities, um, if there's enough food availability, because they're at moderate density, they're not at high density, then the sexually mature males and females that are not the alphas within a pack, they might just go off and leave and start their own pack and be their own alphas because there's enough food to go around. They don't have to resort to pack behavior um, to successfully hunt and find that food. Now, what might happen at very low densities? Um, if wolves, if a wolf population is at very, very low densities, females might actually have trouble finding a mate. Um, and that might make the population decrease even further, which is an example of the Ali effect, which is really important for understanding in conservation biology. So this is when at low population size, birth rates decline or mortality increases. Um, so that's what's happening uh, wait, here. Yeah this really precipitous drop in population size. Um, so below some, this is where the minimum density is, um, below some min minimum density, um, the rate of population growth is negative. So at low population size, birth rates decline more, or mortality increases. Um, so this is the opposite of most of what we were just talking about. And then there's some sort of minimum density when the growth of the population actually goes negative and is likely to go extinct. That's called the Ali effect. Now let's talk about some modern examples of that. At low, So um, one example is American ginseng. I actually just this week coincidentally got um, American ginseng seeds in the mail that I ordered like way back in spring um, from a seed company um, that I'm hoping to plant in my yard and hopefully I'll plant enough of them that the Ali effect won't happen. So what happens, why there is, you see the Ali effect in some American ginseng populations is because the population is just way too small to be noticed by pollinators. So you might imagine that like, if a population is way, is so low and so incredibly not dense that it might be hard for one, you know, like agapostum and sweat bee or one hoverfly that pollinates these things, maybe it finds this flower, but the other flowers are so far away that it doesn't even transfer that pollen to them because they're just too far away to find. Um, that's an example of the Ali effect. So hopefully I will have a nice little crop of genetically diverse American ginseng in my backyard so that the Ali, Ali effect doesn't happen. Um, this has also been observed in Vancouver Island marmots. Um, so why it, they think it happens in Vancouver Island uh, marmots, you can actually see. So here's the population size precipitously dropping. Um, and having a negative growth rate, so there, once it hits zero. Um, marmots have some sort of sociality, so they use, um, they live in like groups of burrows together, and they use group vigilance, anti-predator alarm calls, um, communal burrow maintenance, they help each other clean their burrows, um, and it's really important to have mates nearby and neighboring colonies for them to mate with. They use these kind, this kind of group behavior to protect themselves from predators and to find mates. And if they're way too uh, sparsely populated and they can't find each other, they can't warn each other, then you start to see a negative per capita growth rate. Now hopefully, 
YouTube won't take me down for playing this video, but I just had to show you some examples of their alarm calls because they are just so cute. <laughs> so, okay, wait, can you hear this? I'm gonna start it over again. You have to hear these little. <laughs> I'll play again. Huh. He's gonna do it again. Wait. He's gonna do it. <laughs> oh, hopefully YouTube doesn't take this down. But you can imagine if it's really important for them to hear these calls for them to be protected from predators, and if they're too far away to hear another marmot screaming, <laughs> then that would cause a negative growth rate in the population. Oh, you gonna do it again. Oh, do you guys see a hawk? Oh, okay, that's enough. Uh, you can click on the link and go watch it yourself. Watch them screaming at each other to warn them about hawks. <sighs> anyway, that's it for uh, this lecture. Tune in in a few minutes for when I'm going to record the lecture video for Chapter 12 because it is my favorite topic and I am. it is my jam and I'm so excited to talk about it. So, okay, bye bye